Hello everyone and welcome back to Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A series where you guys ask questions and I answer them to the best of my abilities. This is episode number 60, I believe, and while it doesn't really get easier every time, I'm at least a little bit more accustomed to what's coming down the pipeline, so to speak. For today's video, I'm gonna be answering several questions that were asked about AMD's new 5000G series of Ryzen CPUs with integrated graphics and a bunch of other random questions that maybe you didn't even know you wanted to know the answer to, but now you'll know. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Micro Center, one of my favorite places to buy PC parts, whether it's online or at one of their 25 retail stores in the US. They have consistently competitive prices and an excellent selection of PC hardware and other tech goodies, as well as the custom PC builder on the Micro Center website. Use it to spec out your rig and it will show you parts in stock at your nearest store while ensuring compatibility with your selections. Then you can pick up or have their pros assemble it for you. So click the sponsor link in the description and don't forget to sign up for the free in-store gift. Before we get started, a quick reminder that there's a playlist of Probing Pauls. If you wanna check out old ones, that's linked in the description. And uh, you can even look back down this hole to back when there used to be brightness and light and joy in the world before it started to get much darker. Let's not dwell on that though. Let's get into the first question uh, from Tech Chimp. Actually, this first question is a few questions. Asked for some responses on Twitter and that's where this came from. What are the chances of getting a Ryzen 5000G or non-X CPU from online retailers? Likewise, Tall Titan in the YouTube comments asked Paul, for ones that really don't need a GPU for an HTPC, what's the latest? On the Ryzen 5000 series APUs. This was two weeks ago before the announcement that happened uh, on the 13th this week. As you can see, there were several questions along the same line, uh, and this is uh, us asking me to do an APU or iGPU build like I did back in the 10 series era. So I believe us asked that question before this video was posted. So this is my monthly builds video for April where I went over actually four different builds that don't need graphics cards. They all use iGPUs. So check that video out if you wanna see the parts lists that I went over and a correction, uh, the 32 200G is a four core, four thread processor. But more to the point, the 5000G APUs were literally just announced by AMD and they're confirmed. Unfortunately, they are OEM only for now, which means you would need to buy an actual full system based on one of these that's built by a system integrator rather than buying the uh, CPU or APU and building it yourself. But it does say full release later this year. And this is something that for the Ryzen 4000 series of APUs that you can see listed on this chart here on an Antec and this full articles in the description, by the way, you guys, if you want to uh, read up some more details. But these were some nice APUs, but you could never really buy them directly unless you uh, bought them from overseas, or apparently in some countries they were a little bit easier to get than others, but uh, it's definitely hard to get your hands on these, at least somewhat legitimately if you're in the US. And there's also a 4650G in that series that's a little bit faster than the 4600G, but the main point here is these aren't just CPUs, but they're also graphics cards too. They have integrated graphics, and even though the 4000 series, like the 4000 G based on Renoir, which is seven nanometer Zen 2, and the 5000 series, uh, which is also seven nanometer, but Zen 3, only have Vega 8 graphics versus Vega 11, uh, because of the die shrink, they're able to run them at higher frequencies. So even though these say Vega 8, and if you look at the number of compute units per APU, it is less than uh, what you got with the 2000G and 3000G series. Again, because they're running at higher frequencies, uh, they are still faster. So if you're considering buying a pre-built system, then uh, these should be available pretty soon. Uh, or if you're just keeping your eye on them for uh, future reference, or if you're gonna try to you know, buy one on Alibaba or something like that, which you should do at your own risk, but that should also be potentially something that maybe you can do if, it's, if things go anything like they did with the Ryzen 4000, G series. But at the top, you have an eight core 16 thread model on the 5700G. All these models also have GE options, which are gonna be lower wattage uh, or lower wattage TDP. So those are just gonna run at lower frequencies with the same stats. Otherwise, you can see a 3200 uh, megahertz base clock here versus 3800 megahertz with the 5700G. Then you got a six core 12 thread variant with the 5600G and a four core eight thread variant with the 5300G. So you might look at something like the 5600G and think to yourself, oh, a six core 12 thread part, this is basically like a 5600X with integrated graphics. Kind of, but not exactly, and you should be aware of the variations between them. You do get a higher base frequency with the 5600G, but you get a lower uh, peak or turbo frequency at 4400 megahertz versus 4600. Of course, there are no integrated graphics with the 5600X, but also bear in mind that uh, if you want PCIe 4.0, uh, you need to go with the 5600X. You only get PCIe 3.0 connectivity with these 5000G series uh, APUs. Also, you get half of the L3 cache. You get uh, 60 
16 megs of L3 versus 32 megs of L3 with the 5600X, and that will affect performance depending on uh, what type of CPU workload that you're talking about. But overall, the upshot is gonna be that uh, the 5600X is going to be a, a faster CPU with the 5600G if you're willing to give up uh, PCIe 4.0 and a bit of cache and a bit of frequency, then you get the integrated graphics. So you don't need to roll with a graphics card, at least not at first. Again, a similar situation with the 5700G compared to the 5800X here. Although they have the same base frequency here, uh, the turbo frequency is higher with the 5800X. And you'll probably also find that the turbo, turbo tables are going to work a little bit differently with these because with the 5700G, you only have a 65 watt TDP to work with. So even though the turbo frequency looks like it's just 100 megahertz lower, chances are the sustained frequency that you run at under full load, for example, is also going to be lower on the 5700G than the 5800X. As for motherboard support, you should have X570, B550, and A520 motherboards that will all support officially the 5000G series of APUs. And then you might have some 400 series motherboard support like uh, B450, but that would be up to the motherboard manufacturer to provide a BIOS update that provides that support. I guess the final question would be for the projects that I have uh, going on, which would be the build recommendations that I did at the beginning of this month. Does this announcement affect those at all? And I would say maybe slightly because uh, it is gonna be worth it to keep an eye on the prices of these OEM builds that are gonna be going up for sale very soon. But at the same time, I typically am recommending build parts lists for people who are assembling their own computer. And that's not gonna be something that you're gonna be able to do, at least not right out of the gate with these new 5000G APUs. So with DIY PC building in general right now, we're still in a situation where I'd say particularly with graphics cards and then uh, to a lesser extent with CPUs, you kind of have to build with what's available if you need to build right now. So, so it's a good idea if you're thinking about building to sort of keep your ear to the ground with this stuff so you know what's available, what the prices are, and uh, what is actually worth buying for the money that it's currently costing. Speaking of which, uh, here's a follow-up question from Josh. Really enjoying your videos lately. Thank you very much, Josh. Question for the next Probing Paul, what makes a good balanced parts list and what are some tips you have for choosing parts at a certain budget? So Josh, here again, I point you back towards my monthly builds parts list because here's where I do my best of sort of keeping my ear to the ground for what's available and what you can buy at a certain price. My first two builds are AMD APU builds that cost $533 and $733 respectively, but I am including like the 4650G here, which you can currently buy on Alibaba for $260. That said, you're probably gonna need to wait like a month for it to arrive because it ships from overseas. You might also keep an eye out for buying this domestically, but chances are you'd have to buy on eBay and everywhere I looked there, they were 300 to $350. So I just decided let's go for the budget cost and buy it from Alibaba. Wait, I've been saying Alibaba, I meant to say AliExpress, but uh, you, you get the point. For me though, right now, what makes a balanced parts list is keeping your eye on the two main most expensive parts in the list, which is gonna be your CPU, and then potentially your graphics card, although graphics cards are absurdly overpriced right now, so that's why I've been leaving them out recently. Probably focusing your budget on those two parts with a, an emphasis on the graphics card if uh, you're building a gaming PC in particular, and maybe a little bit more emphasis on the CPU and getting a higher core count, uh, maybe eight cores or more rather than six cores. If you're planning to actually work, with your CPU, or if you're planning to like game and stream at the same time. If you're gonna do something that puts a heavy load on the CPU, then you probably want to spend a little bit more money on your CPU. Beyond that, balancing everything else out and not spending too much money on other things, I think is what makes a balanced build. Like you don't need to spend three or $400 on a motherboard at all for a mainstream system. Probably 150 to 200 bucks is all you need to spend. And keep in mind that PC parts are very much uh, commodities and the prices can fluctuate. They can go up and down. Sometimes there's a shortage of a certain component that causes suddenly RAM prices to go up or power supplies to be in limited availability. But apart from telling you to watch my monthly builds videos every month or you like constantly checking on a daily or weekly basis yourself, I would say PC Part Picker is a great resource to check just so you can cross compare like how much SSDs are selling for on a price per gigabyte basis, for example. And then my final bit of advice would be to understand which parts are actually going to impact the performance of your computer. And that would typically be again, the CPU and the graphics card and then other things that might be effectively keeping your computer cool versus more aesthetic additions like RGB lighting or making sure everything is perfectly color matched. 
or getting that like super blingy version of a 3060 Ti uh, that costs 150 or 200 dollars more than the base model version rather than just upgrading to a 3070 for example. That's also a way that people will spend more money without necessarily getting a lot more performance. Those are my suggestions though so I hope that helps you out to some degree. Let's move on to our next question which is from Arvin Baller. Uh, what would you choose? Oh this is a good question. To get a free supply of whatever PC component you need for the rest of your life or your dogs can talk. Cheers, Paul, and thanks for another awesome probing session. I enjoyed this question because it was different and because I actually had to think about it for a second. At first I was like, oh, well, of course, you know, the long-term joy and connection I would have with my dogs being able to talk is what I should go for. But then I thought, well, if I got a free supply of whatever PC component I would need for the rest of my life, obviously right now the choice would be graphics cards. And I was like, oh, I could get a bunch of graphics cards and I could make amazing profits and sell them and I could suddenly be rich and be able to buy as many talking dogs as I wanted to. But then I realized, no, Paul, that would be selfish. That would be a selfish choice. And the way I should look at this is, what if I could solve the GPU shortage crisis that's going on right now all by myself? If I had an unlimited free supply of this, wouldn't it be worth the sacrifice for me to give up that chance at actually talking to Hiro or Nori and hearing the wonderful things they have to say in order for me to supply the world with as many graphics cards as might be necessary. And I think that's what I would do. If for one, it makes me seem like a really good person. And for two, uh, you know, the dogs, I feel like we communicate, you know, we, I, you just, you guys who have pets or dogs probably know how it goes. You just need to look at your pet in the eyes and, and you know, there's a communication that happens there without the need to actually speak. So that means uh, graphics cards are obviously the better choice. Hero, can you lie down, please? Hero, can you lie down? No, don't go that way. Don't go that way. Please don't go that way, Hero. Can you please lie down? Hero boy, can you lie down? Hero boy, lie down, please. And so we move to our next question. Patrick Trosbach. 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 What are your thoughts about WoW Burning Crusade, uh, the WoW Burning Crusade classic coming to fruition? So I'll be perfectly honest, I played a little bit of WoW Classic when it, WoW Classic sort of relaunched. And one of the things I thought to myself at the time was, oh, this is pretty cool, but uh, I have, I'm so short on time now. But the one thing that I did feel like might actually pull me back into it is the Burning Crusade, uh, a Burning Crusade classic version. Because honestly, this was kind of my golden age of playing World of Warcraft. This is the trailer, by the way, I'll link that in the description, and I hope uh, Blizzard doesn't, doesn't claim my video for it, but whatever, I, I wanted to watch this, so, so there it is. Now, I started playing World of Warcraft and got up to about level 50 by the time the Burning Crusade expansion launched originally, like back in 2006 or whenever that was. And then in Burning Crusade, I actually like did a little bit of raiding, I raided Kara. I didn't do any of the like the crazy high level raids or anything, except for much later on after they became a little bit easier. I never beat Illidan or anything like that. So, you know, that's, that's something that I guess could still be on my life to do list. But I totally see why the World of Warcraft classic has, has been so popular and has maintained popularity because of uh, nostalgia and because it's just fun for a lot of people. And for myself and my wife, um, you know, it, it goes back to a time when we were still dating and uh, that was one of the things that was like the best thing ever was the fact that my new girlfriend at the time introduced me to World of Warcraft. That, it, like, I didn't, I didn't tell her to play it, she told me to play it. So I guess to answer your question, uh, yes, I'm totally interested, but I'm also like, I have no idea how I will make time for that because uh, we got a two-year-old and uh, all of the other stuff that we have to do on a regular basis because my wife works full-time and I uh, basically work full-time. So maybe I'll have to figure out streaming or something like that and get into some sort of schedule. I don't know. I don't want to make any promises, but I'm interested. I'm very interested. Speaking of uh, an awkward segue, JC has the next question asking, hey Paul, we know you're friends with Kyle, but how are your relations with other tech YouTubers. Yes, I am friends with Kyle, and for anyone who has asked, because I have been asked a few times, like, hey Paul, when are you and Kyle gonna bring back awesome hardware or whatever? Uh, that's not currently planned at all right now, but I did want to assure you guys that Kyle and I have still been hanging out, because we're friends. So like every couple weeks we've been getting together, just chilling, having some beers, it's been good times. And no, we're not interested in streaming that at all, but to answer your question, the other tech YouTubers who I typically work with, I'll be perfectly honest, I have not done a good job at uh, keeping up with those relationships. So uh, like I'm, I'm friends with uh, Jay and I'm friends with Steve and uh, you know, I would even say I'm friends with Linus, but I think what sort of uh, maintains those relationships has been the events that we've gone to in the past, which have typically happened 
happened, you know, with some regularity every three to five or six months, there's some NVIDIA or AMD or Intel thing that happens that brings us to the same place and we get to hang out and talk in person. Of course, events were pretty much put on hold for the duration of last year and up through this year and we're looking forward to when they can happen again, but we don't know when that's actually going to be an option again. So uh, I'm looking forward to when it is and I guess what I would say is I am not good with keeping up with a lot of my friends. I, I, I don't do that. I don't reach out as often as I should. So that's part of the reason I answered your question. If you guys have friends who you haven't talked to in a long time, or you feel like, oh man, I need to catch up with this person, give them a call or a text or reach out in some way, try to keep in touch. And I'm gonna try to do the same. And uh, I'll also try to do a little bit more collaborations with more tech YouTubers because uh, that's a good thing to do from time to time. And I haven't done anything like that at all recently. Next question from Beardly Andrew. Hey Andrew, what should you focus on more when starting a YouTube channel? consistency or content. I actually already responded to uh, Andrew, and this was from my uh, Twitter question that I asked people earlier today. Uh, I think having fun and not crushing yourself with high expectations is most important. And that's that's like for me, so just to clarify here, for me, producing YouTube videos has always been about trying to maintain some level of consistency that also balances, I guess, my personal mental health, health or my ability to remain engaged, focused, interested, and for it to still feel like fun. So uh, so I know a lot of people are interested in becoming content creators or YouTubers or whatever, but make sure that if you're starting out that you're doing it as a fun side project rather than suddenly diving into like, I'm going to invest all of my time in this and I'm gonna make super awesome videos. Like it's good to make awesome videos, but if you suddenly pour all of your energy into it, even if you make awesome videos, but you don't have the following, I feel like it's really easy to burn out quickly because you're not gonna get the uptake of views on that content that that you're maybe expecting. It takes a really long time and a lot of consistency to build an audience and to build a subscriber base on YouTube. So making sure that you're having fun with it means that you're gonna want to keep coming back and doing it over and over again. And it might take a lot of that before you actually build up the momentum to the point where you can sustain it as a part-time job or even a full-time job. And the final question here from Red from the random category, any favorite local brew beer or alcoholic beverage? And uh, I bring this up because I actually have one on hand here to show. If I'm ever asked, Hey Paul, what kind of beer do you want? I usually say, get me a red or brown ale, because that's usually I like. That's usually what I'm happy with. Brown ale, I feel like I'm, I'm particularly fond of, uh, and that also uh, applies to brown porter. And this is a brown porter that I have been enjoying recently. Uh, this is from Mammoth Brewing Company, so it's somewhat local. It's more of a NorCal thing than a SoCal thing. We were on a little trip up to that region recently and uh, came back with a big brown porter, the Double Nut Brown, which also has a Pretty cool name, Double Nut Brown from Mammoth Brewing Company. A brown porter and quite tasty. I'm not gonna open it right now. I'm saving it for a special occasion. Maybe tech news, who knows? That'll be coming up this Sunday. That is gonna wrap it up for episode 60 of Probing Paul though. And again, if you guys have questions for me to answer in the next episode, leave them in the comment section down below. Also links to stuff I talked about is down there as well as timestamps and, uh, oh, links to my store. If you wanna buy a shirt or a mug or a pint glass or like a fancy bottle opener like this one that's uh, also now available in sets along with my Imperial pint glasses and the bamboo coasters, you can go to paulshardware.net. Also, if you wanna click the like button on this video or subscribe to my channel, you're totally welcome to do that too. Thank you guys so much once again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.